The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you people say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Again, it's a great joy to be with you here this, this morning. Uh, I can't promise one of those five-minute, complete, punchy homilies that you're used to hearing from Father Bear every Sunday with a very clear point. He's the master of that, I know. I've heard them many times. Unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to me expound a little bit more about why this dedication of the altar is such a big deal. Why does it make such a difference in the life of the church? You know, you'll see in just a few moments, if you've never seen this ceremony, that we use all of our symbols in this ceremony. We sprinkle the, water with ho the altar with holy water. We, in fact, uh, bless it with incense, and we anoint it with chrism, sacred chrism. You know, that's the oil that the bishop consecrates once a year at the chrism mass, the most sacred of all the oils. And then we light candles around it. All of these symbolizing, symbolizing what? Just what we heard in our first reading. How awesome is this shrine? It is nothing else but the abode of God that is the gateway to heaven. The reason we surround and consecrate this altar with so many symbols is because this altar is for us the gateway to heaven. This altar is for us the holiest place on earth. Why? Because here heaven and earth become one. Because here at this altar, our daily life meets the divine life of Jesus Christ. And here on this altar, we have what we say is the holiest of exchanges. We bring all of our lives, our our sacrifices, our struggles, our prayers, and we place them on the altar. And they're united to Jesus' own prayer and transfigured, transformed. And the life of Jesus comes back to us through this altar. What an exchange. We give our poor human lives and we receive the very life of God the body and blood of Jesus. It's what makes this altar so holy. Of course, what is an altar? An altar is a place of sacrificial worship. Sacrificial worship. I hope you realize that throughout the history of the world, anyone in the whole world who wanted to worship God before modern times, when we became so heady, Whenever people wanted to worship God, they always knew it involved sacrifice. To worship was to offer something to God. And this is what the Jewish people did when they worshiped God. They offered goats and bulls and the blood of goats and bulls. And they offered it upon the altar because God had told them that through that offering, their sins would be wiped away. But when Jesus came, he transformed that. As we heard today, 
when Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritans, you remember, were a sect of the Jews. And they were a sect because they had a different way of worship. They worshiped on the mountain where that well was, where Jesus met the Samaritan woman, but the Jews worshiped at the temple, on the temple mount where they made their sacrifices. And Jesus, when this woman objects, she says, she says, but you Jews say we're to worship God on the mountain. Jesus says, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Brothers and sisters, what do we do at this altar? We worship God as he desires to be worshiped. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We worship him with the worship that Jesus offered him. Remember what Jesus said just two chapters before, the word is John chapter four, the Samaritan woman. In John chapter two, remember what Jesus did? He went into the temple and he overthrew the tables of the money changers. And he said, stop turning my father's house into a den of thieves. And they said, by what authority do you do this? Who are you that you would cleanse this temple? And he said, I tell you, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And then St. John tells us he was speaking about the temple of his body. Brothers and sisters, where is true worship offered? Where is the only true worship that has ever been offered in the history of the world? Where was it offered? It was offered in the heart of Jesus Christ, the true temple, as he hung upon the altar of the cross, when he gave his life on our behalf to the Father. That's the one sacrifice that can truly take away all the sins of the world because Jesus is both fully human like us and fully divine. This is in fact why when Jesus died on the cross, what happened in the temple? The curtain was torn in two of the old temple. Why? Because the old worship was destroyed and the new worship the worship in spirit and in truth began when Jesus worshiped the Father on the altar of the cross. But of course, Jesus didn't just do that a long time ago for us because he wanted us to be worshipers in spirit and truth. And he knew that in our sinful humanity, there's no way we could do that on our own. And so the night before he died, he said to his apostles, do this in memory of me. He said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Of course, he was describing, he was even making present before it happened the worship of the Father that he would perform on the cross. You cannot understand the words of the Eucharist. This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you without understanding that they point to the cross. And you can't understand the cross without understanding the words of the Eucharist, which reveal what happened on the cross. His body was given for us. His blood was poured out in worship for us. And thus every time a priest stands at this altar and says those words, every time he does that, we become participators in the one true worship of the cross. Because when the priest says those words in the person of Jesus Christ, in fact, the death of Jesus 
the gift of his life becomes present again on this altar. You see, heaven and earth stand still. And the fact, the truth, the gift, the worship of Calvary become present here. But not only that, because Calvary doesn't end on the cross. In fact, we know that Jesus enters into the true Holy of Holies where the Father is with his own blood, crying out on our behalf. That blood which, as the second reading said, speaks more eloquently than that of Abel's blood. Abel's blood, you remember, when he was killed by Cain, it cried out for vengeance. Jesus' blood, which he brings to the Father on our behalf, cries out for mercy. And so, in fact, whenever we celebrate Holy Mass at this altar, this altar becomes one with the altar of heaven. This is just what we read in our, in our second reading today, right? Brothers and sisters, you have not approached that which could be touched, a blazing flyer in a gloomy darkness and storm and trumpet blast, Mount Sinai, he's talking about, right? He says, no, it wasn't the mountain that you couldn't touch. No, this is a new mountain. This is why, by the way, altars are always supposed to be up steps, right? It symbolizes the mountain. No, you have approached Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and countless angels in festal gathering, and the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the just made perfect, and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. You see, when we come to this altar, we stand in the presence of all the angels and saints. And in those moments, we enter into the true worship that even now is going on in heaven, which is why we sing with all the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Because at this altar, time and eternity meet. My brothers and sisters, you and me were, were weak and sinful human beings. And we want to worship God. We want to give him our lives, but we do a really poor job of it because we're weak and sinful human beings. And Jesus knew that on our own we could never please him. We could never please the Father on our own because of our sins. And so God had a plan to send his son Jesus to become one of us. The second person of the Trinity took on human flesh. And then Jesus offered on our behalf the worship that we couldn't offer to the Father. But then in order that we could become the true worshipers the Father seek, he leaves us the Eucharist and the power of his Holy Spirit. And through our baptism and the fact that we are united in the one Spirit of God, when we come here to this altar every Sunday, even every day, we bring our poor prayers. We bring our poor hopes. We bring our poor sacrifices, even our own poor lives, and we place them on this altar. But you see, then they are united to Jesus' one true sacrifice. They are united with Jesus' one true prayer that he offered on the cross. And they are made pleasing to the Father. And then what does the Father do? The Father then gives us back anew his own Son. He shares with us through this altar the life of Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus, which fills us with the life of God, which is the Spirit of God, and allows us to be transformed more and more into Jesus, 
so that as we go out into the world, we in fact can radiate Jesus to the world. Because on this altar, our poverty is transformed into divinity. We offer poor prayers and we receive back the very life of God. Here you see what it means to live the life of the Trinity which we celebrate today. To live the life of the Trinity is to worship in spirit and truth. Through baptism, you and I have become God's beloved sons and daughters. And through the Holy Spirit, we are able to be one at this altar with Jesus the Son worshiping the Father in heaven. This is what we will do every day for all of eternity. We will be worshiping the Father with Jesus. And here, when we come to this altar, we learn how our lives are supposed to be, a gift to Jesus. And when we give that poor gift to him, he gives us back his very life so that we can be one with him and share with him eternal life.